Stories of Futures Past presents Five Stories Featuring Time Travel Number Two The Futile Flight of John Arthur Benn by Richard Wilson Pangborn's Paradox by David Mason Hall of Mirrors by Frederick Brown Prison of a Billion Years by Stephen Marlowe Project Mastodon by Clifford D. Simak The Futile Flight of John Arthur Benn by Richard Wilson, writing as Edward Halibut Originally published in Infinity Science Fiction, February 1956. Narrated by Tom Trisser. By putting himself into reverse, the doom-intended man left the 20th century far ahead. 1956 was a good year to get out of. John Arthur Benn watched the roaring 20s go by, and the gay 90s backwards and wondered how it would be to pilot a riverboat on the Mississippi, or to fight under John Paul Jones. Before he was really aware of it, he was for a speeding second a contemporary of another John, Smith, and thought about the life of the Redmen before the colonists began changing things around. By that time the scenery had begun to get monotonous, just shrinking trees, and John Arthur Benn swung over into lateral, Ah, England! There went another namesake, Ben Johnson, and in a very little while he had considered slowing down to meet still another. But King Arthur flashed past and into a womb in West Wales just as John was convulsed by a sneeze. It was quite draughty, and he should have dressed more warmly. And as he stuffed his handkerchief back in his pocket, he caused just a tantalising glimpse of an interesting druid ceremony. John Arthur Benn blacked out somewhere in the limbo of the pre-Christian era, as he had been warned he might, and when he came to, he found himself lying in a rather uncomfortable heap with his head in a mushroom patch. The mushrooms and the trees around him weren't shrinking any more, so John knew he'd stopped, or at least was going very slowly. After a while he decided he wasn't going at all, and got to his feet. It seemed very pleasant here, in the woods, so he found a fallen tree to sit on, and took a wrapped sandwich and a small vacuum bottle of coffee out of his pocket. When he'd finished his meal, he walked to a stream nearby, rinsed the bottle, tossed the waxed paper onto the water to be carried away, and pocketed the vacuum bottle. Now he thought, what? This was scarcely dinosaur country. At this point a wild boar chased him up a tree. To be killed by a boar would be ignominious, after all this, although the animal was well enough tusked to have done the job, and so John Arthur Benn climbed to a high branch where the boar's persistent forced him to spend the night. He slept somehow, and, with the closing of his conscious mind, the one that wanted to meet a dinosaur in fatal combat, the conventional subconscious, which also sought suicide but in a more familiar way, shifted him out of reverse. When he awoke, he was back in 1956, in Philadelphia. Irrevocably, John Arthur Benn knew. He went home and hanged himself in a closet. The End Subscribe for your daily stories of futures past. And now for the next story. Pangborn's Paradox by David Mason Originally published in Infinity, June 1958 Narrated by Tom Trissel Temporal paradoxes, Pangborn said in that extra stuffy tone he used when he wanted to give us an adequate idea of his superiority, are not to be regarded as inconsistencies per se. "'Why not?' demanded Dr. Randall's voice from the depth of the wing-chair. 
All we had been able to see of him for the past half hour had been his legs, but apparently Pangborn's tone had been too much. Prove it! Pangborn's tone became even more lofty. My own theory is that such paradoxes, if reduced to practice, would prove not to be paradoxical at all. Such as the famous idea about going back and killing one's grandparents? von Juntz asked, stroking his beard. We all like to have our little oddities and the faculty of Miskatonic. Von Juntz liked to look like a nineteenth century Heidelberger. Pangborn of physics liked to assume a personality pattern that would annoy people. Dr. Randall of the Department of Advertising Arts wrote poetry in secret. And I liked to drink. Problem of killing grandparents before parents were born, I said, pouring myself another. Question, if you can be born after that. Question, if you can't be born, how did you do it? Not really possible, Pangborn. You can't test it. I made a mental note to bring up the low quality of faculty club whisky at the next business meeting. It had everything else a good faculty club should have. Brown leather armchairs, old magazines, fresh newspapers, a dusty chessboard, cut glass decanters. It was a place well suited for comfortable reading, talking and drinking, except for the quality of the whisky. "'Can't kill Grandpa,' Dr. Randall said from far down in his comfortable chair. "'No such thing as time travel.' "'You underestimate the physics department,' Pangborn told us coldly. "'In spite of heavy losses to our staff, last year's treason trials cost us three of our most brilliant young men. We've made some very remarkable strides. We have what is crudely termed a time machine, although the correct term is temporal transducer. In fact, we are currently conducting some very interesting researches with it. "'Then you have tried the killing of a grandfather, huh, Doctor?' von Junst inquired. "'You have found why it cannot be done, yes?' "'We have not yet gotten around to such minor matters,' Pangborn said. "'But in time—' He began to look interested. "'Ah! Wait a minute. In practice that would be—' "'Whose grandfather should we choose?' His eyes glittered. There is always the question of risk, of course, but it would be difficult for the law to legally consider it as actually murder. My grandfather is already dead. He hesitated. There is the possibility of disappearing. But, von Juntz reminded him, by your own statement you said it, that there is no paradox and no risk. Grandpa would be dead. You would be alive and there is no paradox, yes? Q.E.D., Pangborn snapped. Reduction ad absorbum. Et pons asinorum, von Juntz snapped back, his beard bristling. These exchanges would have been ever so much better if any of us had ever taken Latin. But I could see that Pangborn was ruffled. Very well, he bit off the words. We'll do it. "'Whose grandfather?' asked Dr. Randall. Pangborn's eyes glittered. "'Mine, naturally. I wouldn't want to endanger any of you, gentlemen. After all, it is my demonstration. I remember my grandfather jabbing me in the belly with a great horny finger when I was too young to defend myself. "'Giddy, giddy,' he used to say, the old buzzard. Died naturally. Apoplexy with a fan dancer it was in a hotel room at the age of ninety-three. Disgraceful. Nobody ever shot him. Don't understand why not. Long overdue. Pangborn rubbed his hands together and started for the door. How about it? Will you gentlemen accompany me to the physics department? On the way over, Randall nudged me and spoke out of the side of his mouth. Three to one, Pangborn vanishes. It seemed like good odds. If Pangborn managed to prevent his father from being born, logically he should prevent himself from being born. But I couldn't visualise him vanishing. Common sense was against it. I'll cover that. I gave Randall three dollars. 
If Pangborn did not vanish, Randall would owe me nine. Now, if Pangborn did not vanish, I would be disappointed, and money would be some consolation. Pangborn passed us through the security guards and into the physics laboratories. No need to describe the temporal transducer. It looked like the usual thing in gadgets, coils, tubes, pipes, condensers, wires, tubes, with a little screen overhead that lets the operator, who stays behind, watch what is happening to his passenger. Pangborn was extremely proud of it. He showed us all over the machine, pointing and naming every part. Von Juntz got his beard caught in a control wheel. That made Pangborn almost good-natured. Then he wanted to choose someone to operate the machine for him. He said my hands shook too much, and von Juntz would not allow his beard to get within five feet of the controls, so he steadied Dr. Randall against a safety railing and instructed him on how to operate the machine. Pangborn set the dials. "'There's one place where I'm certain to find Grandfather any time between 1893 and 1906,' Pangborn told us. "'The Andrew Jackson Saloon Bar on Decatur Street. He spent a lot of time there. Use it for his office, they tell me. He was a lawyer. I've set the machine for there for the month of September, 1896. A good month to die in. Ha!' Pangborn ostentatiously checked the cylinders of a huge antique revolver. Forty-five calibre, Pangborn said grimly. Poke me, Willie. Ha! And he climbed into the machine. All of us crowded around the screen, von Juntz carefully holding his beard. We saw the picture forming, the cut glass and bright gas lamps and polished wood of the saloon bar. Four to one Pangborn vanishes, Randall said suddenly. Any takers, speak now. I reached for my wallet. Von Junt said, If he vanishes, it will be because he was never born, and if he was never born, you won't remember taking bets on him. Here, I said hastily to Randall, I gave you some already. I'll hold my money, hand it back. Randall withdrew a little. Don't you trust me? he asked in a hurt tone. I'll pay you if he doesn't vanish. Shh, von Junt said. We crowded around the screen again. The screen looked down on the bar from above and behind it, like looking in through a window set above the mirror. And at the bar there was only one solitary customer, a tall, lean man in a frock coat and plug hat, with a cigar from which smoke curled richly, and a schooner of beer before him. He looked up at the bar mirror, and we saw a lean, evilly humorous face, with the pangborn features clearly marked on it. Grandpa, von Juntz whispered. In a dark angle of the place, Pangborn himself materialized from the machine. We saw a glimmer as he raised the gun. See, von Juntz whispered, he has forgotten to uncock the safety. Now he has. Now he creeps closer. Soon we shall know the paradox. Grandpa Pangorn had put down his cigar. His hand had slid under the lapel of his frock coat. Just before he whirled, I realized that he had been watching Pangborn in the mirror all the time. He whirled, his hand whipped out from beneath his lapel, and the sound of a gunshot echoed in the saloon. We had a clear view of the angry surprise on Pangborn's face before he toppled nose down into the sawdust. He was quite obviously dead. Whippersnapper, Grandpa Pangborn muttered. He holstered his gun and looked up, and his lean face oddly seemed to be looking straight into the peering eye of the time viewer and into our staring eyes. We could not be seen, or could we? Looking at us, he spoke. Figure that one out! said Grandpa Pangborn. I cut the switch, and the viewer went black. The way I see it, Pangborn vanished, but not in the right way, so Randall owes me nine dollars. But he says he won the bet, 
and he won't even give me back the three I handed him before Pangborn got into that fool machine. The End Subscribe for your daily stories of futures past. And now, for the next story. Hall of Mirrors by Frederick Brown Originally published in Galaxy Science Fiction, December 1953 Narrated by Tom Trisser For an instant, you think it is temporary blindness, this sudden dark that comes in the middle of a bright afternoon. It must be blindness, you think. Could the sun that was tanning you have gone out instantaneously, leaving you in utter blackness? Then the nerves of your body tell you that you are standing, whereas only a second ago you were sitting comfortably, almost reclining, in a canvas chair, in the patio of a friend's house in Beverly Hills, talking to Barbara, your fiancée, looking at Barbara, Barbara in a swimsuit, her skin golden tan in the brilliant sunshine, beautiful. You wore swimming trunks. Now you don't feel them on you. The slight pressure of the elastic waistband is no longer there against your waist. You touch your hands to your hips. You are naked and standing. Whatever has happened to you is more than a change to sudden darkness or to sudden blindness. You raise your hands gropingly before you. They touch a plain smooth surface, a wall. You spread them apart, and each hand reaches a corner. You pivot slowly. A second wall, then a third, then a door. You're in a closet, about four feet square. Your hands find the knob of the door. It turns, and you push the door open. There is light now. The door has opened to a lighted room. A room that you have never seen before. It is not large, but it is pleasantly furnished, although the furniture is of a style that is strange to you. Modesty makes you open the door cautiously the rest of the way, but the room is empty of people. You step into the room, turning to look behind you into the closet, which is now illuminated by light from the room. The closet is and is not a closet. It is the size and shape of one, but it contains nothing. Not a single hook, no rod for hanging clothes, no shelf. It is an empty, blank-walled, four-by-four-foot space. You close the door to it and stand looking around the room. It is about twelve by sixteen feet. There is one door, but it is closed. There are no windows. Five pieces of furniture. Four of them you recognise, more or less. One looks like a very functional desk. One is obviously a chair, a comfortable-looking one. There is a table, although its top is on several levels instead of only one. Another is a bed or couch. Something shimmering is lying across it, and you walk over and pick the shimmering something up and examine it. It is a garment. You are naked, so you put it on. Slippers are part way under the bed or couch, and you slide your feet into them. They fit, and they feel warm and comfortable as nothing you have ever worn on your feet has felt. Like lamb's wool, but softer. You are dressed now. You look at the door, the only door of the room except that of the closet. Closet? from which you entered it. You walk to the door, and before you try the knob, you see the small typewritten sign pasted just above it that reads, This door has a time lock set to open in one hour. For reasons you will soon understand, it is better that you do not leave this room before then. There is a letter for you on the desk. Please read it. It is not signed. You look at the desk and see that there is an envelope lying on it. You do not yet go to take that envelope from the desk and read the letter that must be in it. Why not? Because you are frightened. 
you see other things about the room. The lighting has no source that you can discover. It comes from nowhere. It is not indirect lightning. The ceiling and the walls are not reflecting it at all. They didn't have lighting like that back where you came from. What did you mean by back where you came from? You close your eyes. You tell yourself, I am Norman Hastings. I am an associate professor of mathematics at the University of Southern California. I am 25 years old, and this is the year 1954. You open your eyes and look again. They didn't use that style of furniture in Los Angeles, or anywhere else that you know of, in 1954. That thing over in the corner, you can't even guess what it is. So might your grandfather, at your age, have looked at a television set. You look down at yourself, at the shimmering garment that you found waiting for you. With thumb and forefinger you feel its texture. It's like nothing you've ever touched before. I am Norman Hastings. This is 1954. Suddenly you must know, and at once. You go to the desk and pick up the envelope that lies upon it. Your name is typed on the outside, Norman Hastings. Your hands shake a little as you open it. Do you blame them? There are several pages typewritten. Dear Norman, it starts. You turn quickly to the end to look for the signature. It is unsigned. You turn back and start reading. Do not be afraid. There is nothing to fear but much to explain. Much that you must understand before the time lock opens that door. Much that you must accept and obey. You have already guessed that you are in the future, in what to you seems to be the future. The clothes and the room must have told you that. I planned it that way so the shock would not be too sudden, so you would realise it over the course of several minutes rather than read it here, and quite probably disbelieve what you read. The closet from which you have just stepped is, as you have by now realised, a time machine. From it you stepped into the world of 2004. The date is April 7th, just fifty years from the time you last remember. You cannot return. I did this to you, and you may hate me for it. I do not know. That is up to you to decide. But it does not matter. What does matter, and not to you alone, is another decision which you must make. I am incapable of making it. Who is writing this to you? I would rather not tell you just yet. By the time you have finished reading this, even though it is not signed, for I knew you would look first for a signature, I will not need to tell you who I am. You will know. I am seventy-five years of age. I have, in this year 2004, been studying time for thirty of those years. I have completed the first time machine ever built, and thus far its construction, even the fact that it has been constructed, is my own secret. You have just participated in the first major experiment. It will be your responsibility to decide whether there shall ever be any more experiments with it, whether it should be given to the world, or whether it should be destroyed and never used again. End of the first page. You look up for a moment, hesitating to turn the next page. Already you suspect what is coming. You turn the page. I constructed the first time machine a week ago. My calculations had told me that it would work, but not how it would work. I had expected it to send an object back in time. It works backward in time only, not forward physically unchanged and intact. My first experiment showed me my error. I placed a cube of metal in the machine. It was a miniature of the one you just walked out of, and set the machine to go backward ten years. I flicked the switch and opened the door, expecting to find the cube vanished. Instead, 
I found it had crumbled to powder. I put in another cube and sent it two years back. The second cube came back unchanged, except that it was newer, shinier. That gave me the answer. I had been expecting the cubes to go back in time, and they had done so, but not in the sense I had expected them to. Those metal cubes had been fabricated about three years previously. I had sent the first one back years before it had existed in its fabricated form. Ten years ago it had been ore. The machine returned it to that state. Do you see how our previous theories of time travel have been wrong? We expected to be able to step into a time machine in, say, 2004, set it for fifty years back, and then step out in the year 1954. But it does not work that way. The machine does not move in time. Only whatever is within the machine is affected, and then just with relation to itself, and not to the rest of the universe. I confirm this with guinea pigs, by sending one six weeks old five weeks back, and it came out a baby. I need not outline all my experiments here. You will find a record of them in the desk, and you can study it later. Do you understand now what has happened to you, Norman? You begin to understand, and you begin to sweat. The I who wrote that letter you are now reading is you, yourself at the age of seventy-five in this year of two thousand and four. You are that seventy-five-year-old man, with your body returned to what it had been fifty years ago, with all the memories of fifty years of living wiped out. You invented the time machine. And before you used it on yourself, you made these arrangements to help you orient yourself. You wrote yourself the letter which you are now reading. But if those fifty years are, to you, gone, what of all your friends, those you loved? What of your parents? What of the girl you are going, were going, to marry? You read on. Yes, you will want to know what has happened. Mum died in 1963, Dad in 1968. You married Barbara in 1956. I am sorry to tell you that she died only three years later in a plane crash. You have one son. He is still living. His name is Walter. He is now forty-six years old and is an accountant in Kansas City. Tears come into your eyes and for a moment you can no longer read. Barbara dead. Dead for forty-five years. And only minutes ago, in subjective time, you were sitting next to her, sitting in the bright sun in a Beverly Hills patio. You force yourself to read again. But back to the discovery. You begin to see some of its implications. You will need time to think to see all of them. It does not permit time travel as we have thought of time travel, but it gives us immortality of a sort. Immortality of the kind I have temporarily given us. Is it good? Is it worth while to lose the memory of fifty years of one's life in order to return one's body to relative youth? The only way I can find out is to try, as soon as I have finished writing this and made my other preparations. You will know the answer. But before you decide, remember that there is another problem more important than the psychological one. I mean overpopulation. If our discovery is given to the world, if all who are old or dying can make themselves young again, the population will almost double every generation. Nor would the world, not even our own relatively enlightened country, be willing to accept compulsory birth control as a solution. Give this to the world, as the world is today in 2004, and within a generation there will be famine, suffering, war, perhaps a complete collapse of civilization. Yes, we have reached other planets, but they are not suitable for colonizing. 
The stars may be our answer, but we're a long way from reaching them. When we do some day, the billions of habitable planets that must be out there will be our answer, our living room. But until then, what is the answer? Destroy the machine? But think of the countless lives it can save, the suffering it can prevent. Think of what it would mean to a man dying of cancer. Think. Think. You finish the letter and put it down. You think of Barbara dead for forty-five years, and of the fact that you were married to her for three years, and that those years are lost to you. Fifty years lost. You damn the old man of seventy-five whom you became, and who has done this to you, who has given you this decision to make. Bitterly, you know what the decision must be. You think that he knew, too, and realise that he could safely leave it in your hands. Damn him! He should have known. Too valuable to destroy, too dangerous to give. The other answer is painfully obvious. You must be custodian of this discovery, and keep it secret until it is safe to give, until mankind has expanded to the stars and has new worlds to populate, or until... Even without that, he has reached a state of civilization where he can avoid overpopulation by rationing births to the number of accidental or voluntary deaths. If neither of those things has happened in another fifty years, and are they likely so soon, then you, at seventy-five, will be writing another le letter like this one. You will be undergoing another experience similar to the one you're going through now, and making the same decision, of course. Why not? You'll be the same person again. Time and again, to preserve this secret until man is ready for it. How often will you again sit at a desk like this one, thinking the thoughts you are thinking now, feeling the grief you now feel? There is a click at the door, and you know that the time lock has opened that you are now free to leave this room, free to start a new life for yourself in place of the one you have already lived and lost. But you are in no hurry now to walk directly through that door. You sit there, staring straight ahead of you blindly, seeing in your mind's eye the vista of a set of facing mirrors, like those in an old-fashioned barber shop, reflecting the same thing over and over again, diminishing into far distance. The End Subscribe for your daily stories of futures past. And now, for the next story. Prison of a Billion Years by Stephen Marlowe Writing as C. H. Thames Originally published in Imagination, April 1956 Narrated by Tom Trussell Adam Slade crushed the guard's skull with a two-foot length of iron pipe. No one ever knew where Slade got the iron pipe, but it did not seem so important. The guard was dead. That was important and Slade was on the loose, with a hostage that was even more important. The hostage's name was Marcia Lawrence. She was twenty-two years old, and pretty, and scared half out of her wits. She was, before she became a hostage, a reporter for Interplanetary Video. She had been granted the final pre-execution interview with Adam Slade, and she had looked forward to it for a long time, but it had not worked out as planned. It had not worked out as planned because Slade, only hours from the execution chamber with absolutely nothing to lose, had splattered the guard's brains around the inside of his cell and marched outside with a frightened Marsha Lawrence. 
outside. Outside the cell block, while other condemned prisoners roared and shouted and banged tin cups on bars and metal walls and Judas Hole grills. Outside the prison compound and across the dome-enclosed city which served the prison. Then outside the dome. Outside the dome there was rock, rock only, twisted and convoluted and thrusting and gigantic like monoliths of a race of giants, rock alone under the awesome grey sky, steaming rock, for some of the terrestrial waters were still trapped at great depths, and the sea far off, booming against rocky headlands, hissing tidily and slowly, in an age-long process pulverising the rock. The sea far off, a clean sea, not sea-smelling sea, a sea whose waters must evaporate countless times and be borne up over the naked rocks in vapour and clouds, and come down in pelting endless rain, and rush across the rock, frothing and steaming, a sea which must do this countless times in the eons to come, and would do it to bring salinity to its own waters. It kind of scares the hell out of you, doesn't it? Adam Slade said. He was a big man with a thick neck and heavy, sleepy-looking eyes and a blue beard shadow on his stubborn jaw. He said those words as he climbed out of the prison tank with Marsha Lawrence. The tanks' metal was still warm from overheated travel. I didn't think anything would scare you. Marsha Lawrence said. She had conquered her initial terror in the five hours of clanking tank flight from the prison. They had come a great many miles from the prison dome, paralleling the edge of the saltless sea, and then finally, when the fuel was almost gone, clanking and rattling down toward the sea. She was a newspaper woman, that above all now. She must not be afraid. She had a story here, a story. Get moving, Adam Slade said. I got nothing against you, lady, he told her for the tenth time. But you try anything, you're dead. You get that? I got nothing to lose. One time is all they can kill me. But first they got to find me, and they won't be able to take me as long as you're here. Just stay meek, and you'll stay alive. "'How long do you think you can hold out?' Marsha Lawrence asked practically. They had begun to walk away from the now useless tank. Adam Slade was carrying the dead guard's M-gun in the crook of his bent left arm and walking with long, easy, ground-consuming strides. Marsha almost had to run to keep up with him as they went down a stretch of slightly sloping black rock toward the steaming, hissing, pounding, roaring, exploding surf. Slade smiled. Plenty of water, he said. But no food, Mr. Slade. There is absolutely no food on earth now, and no possible way of getting food unless you want to stick around for a few million years. You think I came out here without a plan? Slade asked with some hostility. I don't know. You were desperate. As long as you're with me, I figure they might follow. But they won't rush me. They might even send over a copter, but I won't try anything. Not with you here. Desperate? I'm not desperate. And don't you forget it. Desperate, you don't think straight. Once is all they can execute me. I stayed behind. They'd have done it. If they catch me, they'll do it. What's the difference? You said you had a plan. They reached the edge of a thrusting headland, the enormous beak-shaped cliff of beetling black rock which leaned out over the young, still saltless ocean. Slade paced back and forth quickly, with a powerful leonine grace, until he found a fault in the rock. The fault tumbled jaggedly, steeply down almost to the edge of the sea. Down there, Slade said, 
we'll follow the sea coast back to prison. Back? Marcia said in disbelief. Hell yes, back. You said it yourself. There's no food out here. Since there ain't no life, of course there's no food. Oh, it's a great place for a prison, all right. Whoever thought of it ought to win a prize. A prison. A billion years in the past. What's the word? Archaeozoic, she supplied. Yeah, Archaeozoic. An Archaeozoic prison. You can escape to your heart's content. But what the hell's the difference? There's no life back here, not yet. The Earth's just a baby. So you escape, and you starve to death. It makes every maximum security jail before this one look like a kid's piggy bank. There hasn't ever been an escape, Marcia said hopefully, as they made their way down to the sea, she in front and Slade behind her with her M-gun. There ain't never been a hostage before. No, there's a hostage now. Marsha Lawrence took a deep breath and asked suddenly, Are you going to kill me? Hell, I don't know. I got no reason to, unless you make me. We're going back there. We're double-tracking along the beach, get me? Back to the prison dome. But Adam Slade won't starve to death out here. We'll double back to the dome and the time machine. Oh, she said. They began to walk along the edge of the sea, its waters sullen grey mirroring the sky. Here on this dawn earth the sky has yet never been blue, for the primordial waters were still falling, falling. It rained almost all the time, and the air was thick with moisture, and every night when the sun, as yet unseen by the dawn earth except as an invisible source of light, went down and darkness came, the mists rolled in from the sea. In the morning, whether rains had fallen or not, the ground was soaked, and tiny freshets rushed down to the sea, returning to it. "'Look out!' he cried suddenly and shoved her against the base of the cliff which overlooked the water. The cliff-top thrust out over them, umbrella-wise. The base of the cliff that was thus a concavity, and they pressed themselves against it now, in shadow. The waters of the infant sea were a hundred yards away, surging and booming against the rock. She heard it soon after he did. A helicopter. She wanted to scream. She wondered if they would hear her scream, but she looked at Adam Slade's face and did nothing. Soon the helicopter came, buzzing low over them, searching. It circled a great many times because the abandoned tank was there. It circled and came down on the beach and two uniformed figures got out. Now she really wanted to scream. One sound. One sound and they would hear her. One quick filling of the lungs and... Adam Slade hit her suddenly and savagely, and the black loomed up at her, but she did not remember striking it. When she awoke, the helicopter was gone. Sorry I had to poke you one, Slade said. He did not seem sorry at all. He said it automatically and then added, "'You ready to walk?' She nodded. She got up and staggered a few steps before her legs steadied under her. Then, with Slade, she walked down along the rocky beach. This, she thought, was a story. It was the only big story she had ever had, and probably she would not live to write it. As a woman, she was almost hysterical with fear, but as a videocaster she was angry. The story was hers, if she lived to tell it. Then she had to live. Time prison, sure, she thought, utterly escape-proof, unless someone like Slade could take a hostage 
double back to the prison dome, the hermetically sealed dome, and somehow trick or overpower the guards who watch the time-travelling machine outside the prison dome. Outside. Naturally, it would be outside. That way the prisoners couldn't get at it. Unless, like Slade, they too were outside. Outside where life had not yet been born. Outside the infant earth. Let a man escape. What did his escape matter? He would live exactly as long as it took a man, reasonably healthy, to starve to death. Unless he had a hostage and a plan. She became aware of rain when they left the cliff overhang. There was almost no wind, and the rain came down slowly at first, huge slow drops which splattered on the black rock. If it gets any harder, Slade said, we'll have to duck under the cliff for protection. You don't know what a rain can be like back here. I've seen them through the dome. But they couldn't go under the cliff for protection, not that they wanted to keep going. For the cliff dropped suddenly in a wild jumble of rocks, and then there was nothing but the sloping black beach sloping down to the sea. Then, all at once, someone opened the sluice gates, and the rain bombarded them. It slapped and bounced off the rock like pistol shots. It struck them like hammers. They staggered under its weight. "'We'll have to go back to the cliffs!' Marsha cried. She yelled it again at the top of her voice because she realised Slade would not hear her otherwise, as the rain cracked and exploded and splattered and crashed. There were no droplets of water, for each one had size and shape and weight, swift falling, hammering weight, as it came down. Each one, Marsha thought wildly, struggling to keep her feet, was the size of your clenched fist there in the grey dawn of earth. "'The cliffs!' she cried again. But Adam Slade shook his head, grabbed her arm above the wrist, and pulled her after him. He pointed ahead in the direction they had been going. He said nothing. There was no need to talk. They were going forward, and if it killed them, probably Adam Slade did not care much. He wanted that prison time machine for his escape, and he was either going to get it or die in the attempt. They went on slowly. First one would fall, and then the other, and when it was Slade who had fallen, she would wait patiently, hopefully. If he ever released his hold on the M-gun... But if it were Marsha who fell, Slade would yank her to her feet savagely, yelling words which she had heard at first, but which after a while, after an eternity of the storm, seemed to merge with the sound of the rain and the far booming of thunder out over the water, and then, as if by magic, she was walking again and stumbling along with the Slade, drenched and beaten and half-drowned. She hardly remembered when night came, but presently she was aware of the darkness and the mist over the sea and over the rock, and now engulfing them with its white ectoplasmic tendrils. In the mist she knew she could escape Slade, and yet she did not. Without Slade now, now in the middle of nowhere there by the sea on the shores of the young earth, she would die in the storm. With Slade, at least for now, was life, and she went on. The thunder followed them, and came closer. By the middle of the night it sounded like artillery at a distance of half a mile, like a barrage of big atomic shells just out of sight behind a black ridge line which wasn't there, and through the deeper rain-wet darkness of early morning, through the mist, Tearing the mist to tatters, shredding it, came the spears and forks and lances of lightning. It was, Marsha thought, 
a nightmare of a storm, and she must remember it, for it would make a story, a real story, if she ever lived to tell it. By morning the air smelled of ozone. It reeked of ozone, and around them, as the grey light seeped out of the wet sky, and the rain suddenly slackened as if the weak daylight dispelled it, the black rocks were blasted and broken where lightning had struck. In the dawn's first light, another helicopter came. Get down, Slade shouted, and they dropped among the blasted black rocks, hiding there, not moving. The helicopter came on through the slackening rain, buzzing a few hundred feet over them, but not circling. It was heading for the abandoned tank, Marsha thought. It wasn't looking for them here. But suddenly the rain came down in all its savage force again, blinding, bounding off the rocks, pounding relentlessly. Overhead, the helicopter seemed to pause like a bird stricken in flight. The rotors whirled a silver shield against the rain, the great drops splattering off the shield. And the helicopter came down under the weight of the rain. It landed a hundred and fifty yards from them down the beach, and Marsha watched breathlessly while three men got out and looked at each other and at the rain. The dawn light was still only a dim grey, and Marsha could not see the men clearly, but abruptly a jagged spear of lightning blasted rock midway between where they were hiding and the helicopter, and in the afterglare, through the wet and almost crackling air, the men were very clear. And clearer still when other lightning came down around them, ringing them in, it seemed like a tent. There was now so much lightning it looked more like an aurora than an electric storm. The dawn earth, before life, spending itself in fury. All at once Marsha was running down toward the edge of the water where the helicopter was. She ran screaming and shouting, but the thunder swallowed her puny voice. At every moment she expected Adam Slade to kill her, to merely stand up with the M-gun and shoot her, but he did not, and perhaps her unconscious mind in the instant she had fled had instinctively known he would not, for if Adam Slade killed her, he had no hostage. If he killed her, and they found him, he would have absolutely no chance. She turned and looked behind her. There was Slade, silhouetted against the lightning, running, covering the ground in huge strides, gaining on her. She did not look back again. The whole world was lightning and thunder, and her legs striking earth under her, up and down, up and down, pounding, running, fleeing, and the rain, Slade's ally, beating her, buffeting her, exploding against her. She stumbled and fell, but she was up and running again in a moment. Now Slade was very close, but the helicopter was close too. She did not think the men there had seen them yet. She waved her arms and screamed, although she knew the screams would not be heard. And then Slade was on her. They went down together, and she knew she was frail and helpless before his great strength. He grabbed her, his hands, angry hands on her throat, and lightning struck. It bounded and bounced off rock a dozen feet from them. It shook the earth and blasted the rock, and pieces like shrapnel clattered all around them, and struck them too, and Marsha felt hot blood on her arm, and it was her own blood. But Slade had been momentarily stunned, and she was running again away from him, but away from the helicopter too. At first she did not realise that, but when she did realise it, it was too late. If she doubled back now, she would rush into Slade's arms. She ran, 
into the sea. It was suddenly, unexpectedly calm. It merely eddied around her ankles, as if waiting for something. The storm seemed to be waiting too, lightning holding back, the thunder stilled, even the rain hanging there in the black heavy sky waiting. Slade came after her, stalking through the surf. A single bolt of lightning lanced down at them, and a great engulfing roar lifted Marcia, carried her, stunned her, and then the rain pelted down again, and the sea was an angry sea, and the air was supercharged with ozone and another smell, like seared flesh. Like seared flesh. She saw Adam Slade then. Slade was down in a foot of water, face down. He was not moving, and the water lapped around him, over him. She went to him, walking slowly. The men from the helicopter were there too. They had seen in that final flash of lightning. "'Are you all right, miss?' one of them shouted. "'Yes, Slade?' They turned him over. They looked at him. Dead, one of them said. Dead, she echoed. She would have collapsed, but they caught her. Then the rain really came down, not as it had come before, which was hard enough. It came in huge globes of water, and each globe was as big as your head, and if it hit, it could stun you. Slade, someone cried as the globes exploded violently in the surf around them. He's dead. He'll keep. And they went back to the helicopter with Marsha to await the end of the storm there. When it was over, when the sky was not black, but merely the colour of lead, they returned down the beach for Slade's body. But Slade wasn't there. But he was dead, Marsha said incredulously. One of the men smiled. He didn't go any place under his own power. He was dead all right. The storm took his body out to sea is all. They stood there for a moment, gazing out across the black troubled water of the infant ocean of the infant earth. A billion years ago. Slade was out there. Slade, dead out there were the tides and the waters and the frequent electric storms out there with a million bacteriological parasites on his dead body and in his dead body which he brought with him marcia said dreamily what are you talking about miss out there in the electric dawn of earth with the bacteria which lived in his body as they lived in all other bodies, out there with them, dead, food for them, food and water and air heavy with ozone and the electric storms. Marsha laughed hysterically. It was a story she wanted to write, but she wouldn't write it. Slade was a killer, condemned to die, but Slade dead out there with his bacteria, Slade evil to man and human society, but not necessarily evil in the implacable ways of nature, or perhaps grimly, terribly evil. Slade out there, dead on the bosom of the primordial waters. Slade back in time a billion years before life had been born on earth. She laughed hysterically as they led her away from the water. They slapped her face, gently at first, then harder. I'll be all right, she managed to say. She would be all right. She could live to forget it. But Slade out there, Slade... 
Slade fathering all life on earth there in the sea with his dead body. Slade, who had sinned and was taken back here to die for his sins so that life could be born. Slade, whose first name was Adam. The End Subscribe for your daily stories of futures past. And now, for the next story. Project Mastodon by Clifford D. Simak Originally published in Galaxy, March 1955 Narrated by Tom Trussell The Chief of Protocol said, Mr. Hudson of our... Uh, Macedonia. The Secretary of State held out his hand. I'm glad to see you, Mr. Hudson. I understand you've been here several times. That's right, said Hudson. I had a hard time making your people believe I was in earnest. And are you, Mr. Hudson? Believe me, sir, I would not try to fool you. And this Macedonia, said the Secretary, reaching down to tap the document upon the desk. You will pardon me, but I've never heard of it. It's a new nation, Hudson explained, but quite legitimate. We have a constitution, a democratic form of government, duly elected officials, and a code of laws. We are a free, peace-loving people, and we are possessed of a vast amount of natural resources, and— Please tell me, sir, interrupted the secretary— just where are you located? Technically, you are our nearest neighbours. But that is ridiculous, exploded Protocol. Not at all, insisted Hudson. If you will give me a moment, Mr. Secretary, I have considerable evidence. He brushed the fingers of Protocol off his sleeve and stepped forward to the desk, laying down the portfolio he carried. Go ahead, Mr. Hudson, said the Secretary. Why don't we all sit down and be comfortable while we talk this over? You have my credentials, I see. Now here is a proposal. I have a document signed by a certain Wesley Adams. He's our first president, said Hudson. Our George Washington, you might say. What is the purpose of this visit, Mr. Hudson? We'd like to establish diplomatic relations. We think it would be to our mutual benefit. After all... We are a sister republic in perfect sympathy with your policies and aims. We'd like to negotiate trade agreements, and we'd be grateful for some point four aid. The secretary smiled. Naturally. Who doesn't? We're prepared to offer something in return, Hudson told him stiffly. For one thing, we could offer sanctuary. Sanctuary? I understand, said Hudson that in the present state of international tensions a foolproof sanctuary is not something to be sneezed at. The secretary turned stone cold. I'm an extremely busy man. Protocol took Hudson firmly by the arm. Out you go. General Leslie Bowers put in a call to state and got the secretary. I don't like to bother you, Herb, he said, but there's something I want to check. Maybe you can help me. Glad to help you if I can. There's a fellow hanging around out here at the Pentagon, trying to get in to see me. Said I was the only one he'd talk to. But you know how it is. I certainly do. Name of Huston or Hudson or something like that. He was here just an hour or so ago, said the secretary. Crackport sort of fellow. He's gone now? Yes. I don't think he'll be back. Did he say where you could reach him? No, I don't believe he did. How did he strike you? I mean, what kind of impression did you get of him? I told you, a crackpot. I suppose he is. He said something to one of the colonels that got me worrying. Can't pass up anything, you know. Not in the dirty tricks department, even if it is a crackpot. These days you've got to have a look at it. He offered sanctuary, said the secretary indignantly. Can you imagine that? He's been making the rounds, I guess, the general said. He was over at AEC, told him some sort of tale about knowing where there were vast uranium deposits. 
It was the AEC that told me he was heading your way. We get them all the time. Usually we can ease them out. This Hudson is just a little better than the most of them. He got in to see me. He told the Colonel something about having a plan that would enable us to establish secret bases anywhere we wished, even in the territory of potential enemies. I know it sounds crazy. Forget it, Les. You're probably right, said the General. But this idea sends me. Can you imagine the look on their Iron Curtain faces? The scared little government clerk, darting conspiratorial glances all about him, brought the portfolio to the FBI. I found it in a bar down the street, he told the man who took him in tow. Been going there for years, and I found this portfolio laying in the booth. I saw the man who must have left it there, and I tried to find him later, but I couldn't. How do you know he left it there? I just figured he did. He left the booth just as I came in, and it was sort of dark in there, and it took a minute to see the thing laying there. You see, I always take the same booth every day, and Joe sees me come in, and he brings me the usual, and— You saw this man leave the booth you usually sit in? That's right. Then you saw the portfolio. Yes, sir. You tried to find the man, thinking it must have been his. That's exactly what I did. But by the time you went to look for him, he had disappeared. That's the way it was. Now tell me, why did you bring it here? Why didn't you turn it in to the management so the man could come back and claim it? Well, sir, it was like this. I had a drink or two, and I was wondering all the time what was in that portfolio. So finally I took a peek, and— And what you saw decided you to bring it here to us. That's right. I saw. Don't tell me what you saw. Give me your name and address, and don't say anything about this. You understand that we're grateful to you for thinking of us, but we'd rather you said nothing. Mum's the word, the little clerk assured him, full of vast importance. The FBI phoned Dr. Ambrose Amberley, Smithsonian expert on paleontology. We've got something, Doctor, that we'd like to have a look at. A lot of movie film. I'd be most happy to. I'll come down as soon as I get clear. End of the week, perhaps? This is very urgent, Doctor. Damnedest thing you ever saw. Big shaggy elephants and tigers with teeth down to their necks. There's a beaver the size of a bear. Fakes, said Amberley, disgusted. Clever gadget. Camera angles. That's what we thought first. But there are no gadget, no camera angles. This is the real McCoy. I'm on my way, the paleontologist said, hanging up. Snide item in smug, smart Alec gossip column. Sources are per se at the Pentagon. There's another mystery that's got the high brass very high. 2. President Wesley Adams and Secretary of State John Cooper sat glumly under a tree in the capital of Macedonia and waited for the Ambassador Extraordinary to return. "'I tell you, Wes,' said Cooper, who under various pseudonyms was also the Secretaries of Commerce, Treasury, and War. "'This is a crazy thing we did. What if Chuck can't get back? They might throw him in jail, or something might happen to the time unit or the helicopter. We should have gone along.' "'We had to stay,' Adams said. "'You know what would happen to this camp or our supplies if we weren't around here to guard them?' The only thing that's given us any trouble is that old Mastodon. If he comes around again, I'm going to take a skillet and bang him in the brisket. That isn't the only reason, either, said President Adams, and you know it. We can't go deserting this nation now that we've created it. We have to keep possession. Just planting a flag and saying it's ours wouldn't be enough. We might be called upon for proof that we've established residence. Something like the old homestead laws, you know. Well established residence, sure enough, growled Secretary Cooper. If something happens to that time unit or the helicopter. You think they'll do it, Johnny? Who do what? The United States. Do you think they'll recognize us? Not if they know who we are. That's what I'm afraid of. Chuck will talk them into it. He can talk the skin right off a cat. Sometimes I think we're going at this wrong. Sure. Chuck's got the long-range view, and I suppose it's best. 
but maybe what we ought to do is grab a good, fast profit and get out of here. We could take in hunting parties at ten thousand a head, or maybe we could lease it to a movie company. We can do all that, and do it legally and with full protection, Cooper told him, if we can get ourselves recognised as a sovereign nation. If we negotiate a mutual defence pact, no one would dare get hostile because we could squawk to Uncle Sam. All you say is true, Adams agreed, but there are going to be questions. It isn't just a matter of walking into Washington and getting recognition. They want to know about us, such as our population. What if Chuck has to tell them it's a total of three persons? Cooper shook his head. He wouldn't answer that way, Wes. He'd duck the question, or give them some diplomatic double-talk. After all, how can we be sure there are only three of us? We took over the whole continent, remember? You know well enough, Johnny, there are no other humans back here in North America. The farthest back any scientist will place the migrations from Asia is 30,000 years. They haven't got here yet. Maybe we should have done it differently, mused Cooper. Maybe we should have included the whole world in our proclamation, not just the continent. That way, we could claim quite a population. It wouldn't have held water. Even as it is, we went a little further than President allows. The old explorers usually laid claim to certain watersheds. They'd find a river, and lay claim to all the territory drained by the river. They didn't go grabbing off whole continents. That's because they were never sure of exactly what they had, said Cooper. We are. We have what you might call the advantage of hindsight. He leaned back against the tree, and stared across the land. It was a pretty place, he thought, the rolling ridges covered by vast grazing areas and small groves, the forest-covered ten-mile river valley. And everywhere one looked, the grazing herds of mastodon, giant bison and wild horses, with the less gregarious fauna scattered hit and miss. Old Buster, the troublesome mastodon, the lone bull which had been probably run out of the herd by a younger rival, stood at the edge of a grove a quarter mile away. He had his head down, and was curling and uncurling his trunk in an aimless sort of way while he teetered slowly in a lazy, crazy fashion by lifting first one foot and then another. The old cuss was lonely, Cooper told himself. That was why he hung around like a homeless dog. Except that he was too big and awkward to have much pet appeal, and more than likely his temper was unstable. The afternoon sun was pleasantly warm, and the air, it seemed to Cooper, was the freshest he had ever smelled. It was, altogether, a very pleasant place, an Indian summer sort of land, ideal for a Sunday picnic or a camping trip. The breeze was just enough to float out from its flagstaff before the tent the national banner of Macedonia, a red rampant mastodon upon a field of green. "'You know, Johnny,' said Adams, "'there's one thing that worries me a lot. "'If we're going to base our claim on precedent, "'we may be way off base. "'The old explorers always claim their discoveries "'for their nations or their king, never for themselves.' "'The principle was entirely different,' Cooper told him. "'Nobody ever did anything for himself in those days. "'Anyone was always under someone else's protection. "'The explorers either were financed by the governments,' or was sponsored by them, or operated under a royal charter or a patent. With us, it's different. Ours is a private enterprise. You dreamed up the time unit and built it. The three of us chipped in to buy the helicopter. We've paid all our expenses out of our own pockets. We never got a dime from anyone. What we found is ours. I hope you're right, said Adams uneasily. Old Buster had moved out from the grove and was shuffling wary toward the camps. Adams picked up the rifle that lay across his knees. Wait, said Cooper sharply. Maybe he's just bluffing. It would be a shame to plaster him. He's such a nice old guy. Adams half raised the rifle. I'll give him three steps more, he announced. I've had enough of him. Suddenly a roar burst out of the air just above their heads. The two leapt to their feet. 
It's Chuck! Cooper yelled. He's back! The helicopter made a half turn of the camp and came rapidly to earth. Trumpeting with terror, old Buster was a dwindling dot far down the grassy ridge. 3. They built the nightly fires circling the camp to keep out the animals. "'It'll be the death of me yet,' said Adams wearily, "'cutting all this wood. "'We have to get to work on that stockade,' Cooper said. "'We've fooled around too long. "'Some night, fire or no fire, "'a herd of mastodon will come busting in, "'and if they ever hit the helicopter, we'll be dead ducks. "'It wouldn't take more than just five seconds "'to turn us into Robinson Crusoe's of the Pleistocene.' "'Well, now that this recognition thing has petered out on us,' said Adams, Maybe we can get down to business. Trouble is, Cooper answered, we spent about the last of our money on the chainsaw to cut this wood and on Chuck's trip to Washington. To build a stockade, we need a tractor. We'd kill ourselves if we tried to rustle that many logs barehanded. Maybe we could catch some of those horses running around out there. Have I ever broken a horse? No, that's one thing I never tried. Me either. How about you, Chuck? Not me, said the ex-ambassador, extraordinarily bluntly. Cooper squatted down beside the coals of the cooking fire and twirled the spit. Upon the spit were three grouse and half a dozen quail. The huge coffee pot was sending out a nose-tingling aroma. Biscuits were baking in the reflector. We've been here six weeks, he said, and we're still living in a tent and cooking on an open fire. We'd better get busy and get something done. The stockade first, said Adams, and that means a tractor. We could use the helicopter. Do you want to take the chance? That's our getaway, once something happens to it. I guess not, Cooper admitted, gulping. We could use some of that point four aid right now, commented Adams. They threw me out, said Hudson. Everywhere I went, sooner or later they got around to throwing me out. They were real organised about it. Well, we tried, Adam said. And to top it off, added Hudson, I had to go and lose all that film and now we have to waste our time taking more of it. Personally, I don't ever want to let another sabre-tooth get that close to me while I hold the camera. You didn't have a thing to worry about, Adams objected. Johnny was right there behind you with a gun. "'Yeah, with a muzzle about a foot from my head when he let go.' "'I stopped him, didn't I?' demanded Cooper. "'With his head right in my lap.' "'Maybe we don't have to take any more pictures,' Adam suggested. "'We'll have to,' Cooper said. "'There are sportsmen up ahead who'd fork over ten thousand bucks easy for two weeks of hunting here. "'But before we could sell them on it, we'd have to show them movies. "'That scene with a sabre-tooth would cinch it.' If it didn't scare them off, Hudson pointed out. The last few feet showed nothing but the inside of his throat. Ex-Ambassador Hudson looked unhappy. I don't like the whole setup. As soon as we bring someone in, the news is sure to leak. And once the word gets out, there'll be guys lying in ambush for us, maybe even nations, scheming to steal the know-how, legally or violently. That's what scares me the most about those films I lost. Someone will find them, and they may guess what it's all about, but I'm hoping they either won't believe it or can't manage to trace us. We could swear the hunting parties is secrecy, said Cooper. How could a sportsman keep still about the mounted head of a sabre-tooth or a record piece of ivory? And the same thing would apply to anyone we approached. Some university would raise dough to send a team of scientists back here and a movie company would cough up plenty to use this place as a location for a caveman epic, but it wouldn't be worth a thing to either of them if they couldn't tell about it. Now, if we could have gotten recognition as a nation, we'd have been all set. We could make our own laws and regulations and be able to enforce them. We could bring in settlers and establish trade. We could exploit our natural resources. It would all be legal and above board. We could tell who we were and where we were, and what we had to offer. "'We aren't licked yet,' said Adams. "'There's a lot that we can do. Those river hills are covered with ginseng. 
We can each dig a dozen pounds a day. There's good money in the root. Ginseng root, Cooper said, is peanuts. We need big money. Or we could trap, offered Adams. The place is alive with beaver. Have you taken a good look at those beaver? They're about the size of a St. Barnard. All the better. Think how much just one pelt would bring. No dealer would believe that it was beaver. He'd think you're trying to pull a fast one on him. And there are only a few states that allow beaver to be trapped. To sell the pelts, even if you could, you'd have to take out licenses in each of those states. Those mastodon carry a lot of ivory, said Cooper. And if we wanted to go north, we'd find mammoths that would carry even more. And get socked into the jug for ivory smuggling. They sat, all three of them, staring at the fire, not finding anything to say. The moaning complaint of a giant hunting cat came from somewhere up the river. 4. Hudson lay in his sleeping bag, staring at the sky. It bothered him a lot. There was not one familiar constellation, not one star that he could name with any certainty. This juggling of the stars, he thought, emphasised more than anything else in this ancient land the vast gulf of years which lay between him and the earth where he had been, or would be, born. A hundred and fifty thousand years, Adams had said, give or take ten thousand. There just was no way to know. Later on there might be. A measurement of the stars and a comparison with their positions in the twentieth century might be one way of doing it. But at the moment any figure could be no more than a guess. The time machine was not something that could be tested for calibration or performance. As a matter of fact, there was no way to test it. They had not been certain, he remembered, the first time they had used it, that it would really work. There had been no way to find out. When it worked, you knew it worked, and if it hadn't worked, there would have been no way of knowing beforehand that it wouldn't. Adams had been sure, of course, but that had been because he had absolute reliance in the half-mathematical, half-philosophic concepts he had worked out, concepts that neither Hudson nor Cooper could come close to understanding. That had always been the way it had been, even when they were kids, with Wes dreaming up the deals that he and Johnny carried out. Back in those days, too, they had used time travel in their play, out in Johnny's backyard they had rigged up a time machine out of a wonderful collection of salvaged junk, a wooden crate, an empty five-gallon paint pail, a battered coffee maker, a bunch of discarded copper tubing, a busted steering wheel, and other odds and ends. In it they had travelled back to Indian before the white man land, and mammoth land, and dinosaur land, and the slaughter, he remembered, had been wonderfully appalling. But in reality, it had been much different. There was much more to it than gunning down the weird fauna that one found. And they should have known there would be, for they had talked about it often. He thought of the bull session back in university, and the little, usually silent kid who sat quietly in the corner, a law school student whose last name had been Pritchard, and after sitting silently for some time, this Pritchard kid had spoken up. If you guys ever do travel in time, you'll run up against more than you bargain for. I don't mean the climate or the terrain or the fauna, but the economics and the politics. They all jeered at him, Hudson remembered, and then had gone on with their talk. And after a short while, the talk had turned to women, as it always did. He wondered where that quiet man might be. Some day, Hudson told himself, I'll have to look him up and tell him he was right. We did it wrong, he thought. There were so many other ways we might have done it, but we'd been so sure and greedy, greedy for the triumph and the glory, and now there was no easy way to collect. On the verge of success, they could have sought out help, gone to some large industrial concern, or an educational foundation, or even to the government. 
like historic explorers, they could have obtained subsidisation and sponsorship. Then they would have had protection, funds to do a proper job, and they need not have operated on the present shoestring, one beaten-up helicopter and one time unit. They could have had several, and at least one standing by in the 20th century as a rescue unit, should that be necessary. But that would have meant a bargain, perhaps a very hard one, and sharing it with someone who had contributed nothing but the money. And there was more than money in a thing like this. There were twenty years of dreams, and a great idea, and the dedication to that great idea, years of work, and years of disappointment, and an almost fanatical refusal to give up. Even so, thought Hudson, they had figured well enough. There had been many chances to make blunders, and they'd made relatively few. All they lacked in the last analysis was backing. Take the helicopter, for example. It was the one satisfactory vehicle for time travelling. You had to get up in the air to clear whatever upheavals and subsidences there had been through geologic ages. The helicopter took you up and kept you clear and gave you a chance to pick a proper landing place. Travel without it, and, granting you were lucky with land surfaces, you still might materialise in the heart of some great tree or end up in a swamp or in the middle of a herd of startled savage beasts. A plane would have done as well, but back in this world you couldn't land a plane, or you couldn't be certain that you could. A helicopter, though, could land almost anywhere. In the time distance they had travelled, they almost certainly had been lucky, although one could not be entirely sure just how great a part of it was luck. Wes had felt that he had not been working as blindly as it sometimes might appear. He had calibrated the unit for jumps of fifty thousand years. Finer calibration, he had said realistically, would have to wait for more developmental work. Using the fifty thousand year calibrations, they had figured it out. One jump, conceding that the calibration was correct, would have landed them at the end of the Wisconsin glacial period two jumps at its beginning. The third would set them down toward the end of the Sangamon interglacial, and apparently it had, give or take ten thousand years or so. They had arrived at a time when the climate did not seem to vary greatly, either hot or cold. The flora was modern enough to give them a home-like feeling. The fauna, modern and Pleistocenic, overlapped, and the surface features were little altered from the twentieth century. The rivers ran along familiar paths. The hills and bluffs looked much the same. In this corner of the earth, at least, a hundred and fifty thousand years had not changed things greatly. Boyhood dreams, Hudson thought, were wondrous. It was not often that three men who had daydreamed in their youth could follow it out to its end. But they had and here they were. Johnny was on watch, and it was Hudson's turn next, and he'd better get to sleep. He closed his eyes, then opened them again for another look at the unfamiliar stars. The east, he saw, was flushed with silver light. Soon the moon would rise, which was good. A man could keep a better watch when the moon was up. He woke suddenly, snatched upright and into full awareness by the marrow-chilling clamour that slashed across the night. The very air seemed curdled by the savage racket, and for a moment he sat numbed by it. Then, slowly, it seemed, his brain took the noise and separated it into two distinct but intermingled categories, the deadly screaming of a cat and the maddened trumpeting of a mastodon. The moon was up, and the countryside was flooded by its light. Cooper, he saw, was out beyond the watchfires, standing there and watching with his rifle ready. Adams was scrambling out of his sleeping bag, swearing softly to himself. The cooking fire had burned down to a bed of mottled coals, but the watchfires still were burning, and the helicopter, parked within their circle, picked up the glint of flames. "'It's Buster,' Adams told him angrily. "'I'd know that bellowing of his anywhere. "'He's done nothing but parade up and down and bellow ever since we got here. 
and now he seems to have gone out and found himself a saber-tooth. Hudson zipped down his sleeping bag, grabbed up his rifle, and jumped to his feet, following Adams in a silent rush to where Cooper stood. Cooper motioned at them. Don't break it up. You'll never see the like of it again. Adams brought his rifle up. Cooper knocked the barrel down. You fool! he shouted. Do you want them turning on us? Two hundred yards away stood the mastodon, and on his back the screeching saber-tooth. The great beast reared into the air and came down with a jolt, bucking to unseat the cat, flailing the air with his massive trunk, and as he bucked the cat struck and struck again with his gleaming teeth, aiming for the spine. Then the mastodon crashed head downward, as if to turn a somersault, rolled and was on his feet again, closer to them now than he had been before. The huge cat had sprung off. For a moment the two stood facing one another. Then the tiger charged, a flowing streak of motion in the moonlight. Buster wheeled away, and the cat, leaping, hit his shoulder, clawed wildly, and slid off. The mastodon whipped to the attack, tusks slashing, huge feet stamping. The cat caught a glancing blow of one of the tusks, screamed and leapt up to land in spread-eagle fashion upon Buster's head. Maddened with pain and fright, blinded by the tiger's raking claws, the old mastodon ran straight toward the camp, and as he ran he grasped the cat in his trunk and tore him from his hold, lifted him high and threw him. "'Look out!' yelled Cooper, and brought his rifle up and fired. For an instant Hudson saw it all as if it were a single scene, motionless, one frame snatched from a fantastic movie epic, the charging mastodon with a tiger lifted and the soundtrack one great blast of bloodthirsty bedlam. Then the scene dissolved in a blur of motion. He felt his rifle thud against his shoulder, knowing he had fired, but not hearing the explosion. And the mastodon was almost on top of him, bearing down like some mighty and remorseless engine of blind destruction. He flung himself to one side, and the giant brushed past him, out of the tail of his eye he saw the throne saber-truth crash to earth within the circle of watchfires. He brought his rifle up again, and caught the area behind Buster's ear within his sights. He pressed the trigger. The mastodon staggered, then regained his stride and went rushing on. He hit one of the watchfires dead centre and went through it, scattering coals and burning brands. Then there was a thud and the screeching clang of metal. "'Oh, no!' shouted Hudson. Rushing forward, they stopped inside the circle of the fires. The helicopter lay tilted at a crazy angle. One of its rotor blades was crumpled. Half across it, as if he might have fallen as he tried to bull his mad way over it, lay the mastodon. Something crawled across the ground toward them, its spitting, snarling mouth gaping in the firelight, its back broken, hind legs trailing. Calmly, without a word, Adams put a bullet into the head of the saber-tooth. 5. General Leslie Bowers rose from his chair and paced up and down the room. He stopped to bang the conference table with a knotted fist. "'You can't do it!' he bawled at them. "'You can't kill the project! I know there's something to it!' We can't give it up. But it's been ten years, General, said the Secretary of the Army. If they're coming back, they'd be here by now. The General stopped his pacing, stiffened. Who did that little civilian squirt think he was, talking to the military in that tone of voice? We know how you feel about it, General, said the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. I think we all recognise how deeply you're involved. You've blamed yourself all these years, and there is no need of it. After all, there may be nothing to it. Sir, said the General, I know there's something to it. I thought so at the time, even when no one else did. And what we've turned up since serves to bear me out. Let's take a look at these three men of ours. We knew almost nothing of them at the time, but we know them now. 
I've traced out their lives from the time that they were born until they disappeared, and I might add that, on the chance it might be all a hoax, we've searched for them for years, and we've found no trace at all. I've talked with those who knew them, and I've studied their scholastic and military records. I've arrived at the conclusion that if any three men could do it, they were the ones who could. Adams was the brains, and the other two were the ones who carried out the things that he dreamed up. Cooper was a bulldog sort of man who could keep them going, and it would be Hudson who would figure out the angles. And they knew the angles, gentlemen. They had it all doped out. What Hudson tried here in Washington is substantial proof of that, but even back in school they were thinking of those angles. I talked some years ago to a lawyer in New York, name of Pritchard. He told me that even back in university they talked of the economic and political problems that they might face if they ever cracked what they were working at. Wesley Adams was one of our brightest young scientific men. His record at the university and his war work bears that out. After the war, there were at least a dozen jobs he could have had, but he wasn't interested. And I'll tell you why he wasn't. He had something bigger, something he wanted to work on. So he and these two others went off by themselves. You think he was working on a temporal? The armor secretary cut in. He was working on a time machine, roared the general. I don't know about this temporal business. Just plain time machine is good enough for me. Let's calm down, general, said the JCS chairman. After all, there's no need to shout. The general nodded. I'm sorry, sir. I get all worked up about this. I've spent the last ten years with it. As you say, I'm trying to make up for what I failed to do ten years ago. I should have talked to Hudson. I was busy, sure, but not that busy. It's an official state of mind that we're too busy to see anyone, and I plead guilty on that score. And now that we're talking about closing the project... It's costing us money, said the army secretary. And we've no direct evidence, pointed out the JSCS chairman. I don't know what you want, snapped the general. If there was any man alive who could crack time, that man was Wesley Adams. We found where he worked, we found the workshop, and we talked to neighbours who said there was something funny going on, and— But ten years, general, the army secretary protested. Hudson came here, bringing us the greatest discovery in all history, and we kicked him out. After that, do you expect them to come crawling back to us? You think they went to someone else? They wouldn't do that. They know what the thing they have found would mean. They wouldn't sell us out. Hudson came with a preposterous proposition, said the man from the State Department. They had to protect themselves, yelled the general. If you had discovered a virgin planet with its natural resources intact, what would you do about it? Come trotting down here and hand it over to a government that's too busy to recognise? General! Yes, sir, apologised the general tiredly. I wish you gentlemen could see my view of it, how it all fits together. First there were the films, and we are the word of a dozen competent paleontologists that it's impossible to fake anything as perfect as those films. But even granting that they could be, there are certain differences that no one would ever think of faking, because no one ever knew. Who, as an example, would put lynx tassels on the ears of a sabre-tooth? Who would know that young Mastodon were black? And the location? I wonder if you've forgotten that we tracked down the location of Adams's workshop from those films alone? They gave us clues so positive that we didn't even hesitate. We drove straight to the old deserted farm where Adams and his friends had worked. Don't you see how it all fits together? I presume, the man from the State Department said nastily, that you even have an explanation as to why they chose that particular location. You thought you had me there, said the general, but I have an answer. A good one. The southwestern corner of Wisconsin is a geologic curiosity. It was missed by all the glaciations. Why, we do not know. Whatever the reason, the glaciers came down on both sides of it and far to the south of it, and left it standing there, a little island in a sea of ice. And another thing, except for a time in the Triassic, that same area of Wisconsin has always been dry land. 
That and a few other spots are the only areas in North America which have not, time and time again, been covered by water. I don't think it necessary to point out the comfort it would be to an experimental traveller in time to be certain that, in almost any era he might hit, he'd have dry land beneath him. The economics expert spoke up. We've given this matter a lot of study, and while we do not feel ourselves competent to rule upon the possibility or impossibility of time travel, there are some observations I would like, at some time, to make. Go ahead right now, said the JCS chairman. We see one objection to the entire matter. One of the reasons, naturally, that we had some interest in it is that, if true, it would give us an entire new planet to exploit, perhaps more wisely than we'd done in the past. But the thought occurs that any planet has only a certain grand total of natural resources. If we go into the past and exploit them, what effect will that have upon what is left of those resources for use in the present? Wouldn't we, in doing this, be robbing ourselves of our own heritage? That contention, said the AEC chairman, wouldn't hold true in every case. Quite the reverse, in fact. We know that there was, in some geologic ages in the past, a great deal more uranium than we have today. Go back far enough, and you'd catch that uranium before it turned into lead. In southwestern Wisconsin there is a lot of lead. Hudson told us he knew the location of vast uranium deposits, and we thought it was a crackpot talking through his hat. If we'd known—let's be fair about this—if we had known and believed him about going back in time, we'd have snapped him up at once, and all this would not have happened. "'It wouldn't hold true with forests, either,' said the chairman of the JCS. "'All with pastures, all with crops.' The economics expert was slightly flustered. "'There is another thing,' he said. "'If we go back in time and colonise the land we find there, what would happen then that? Well, let's call it retroactive. When that retroactive civilization reaches the beginning of our historic period, what will result from that cultural collision? Will our history change? Is what has happened false? Is all?' "'That's all poppycock!' the general shouted. That and this other talk about using up resources, whatever we did in the past, or about to do, has been done already. I've lain awake nights, mister, thinking about all these things, and there is no answer, believe me, except the one I give you. The question which faces us here is an immediate one. Do we give all this up, or do we keep on watching that Wisconsin farm, waiting for them to come back? Do we keep on trying to find, independently, the process or formula of method that Adams found for travelling in time? "'We've had no luck in our research so far, General,' said the quiet physicist who sat at the table's end. "'If you were not so sure, and if the evidence were not so convincing that it had been done by Adams, I'd say flatly that it is impossible. We have no approach which holds any hope at all. What we've done so far, you might best describe as flounder. But if Adams turned the trick, it must be possible. There may be, as a matter of fact, more ways than one.' We'd like to keep on trying. Not one word of blame has been put on you for your failure, the chairman told the physicist. That you could do it seems to be more than can be humanly expected. If Adams did it, if he did, I say, it must have been simply that he blundered on an avenue of research no other man has thought of. You will recall, said the general, that the research program, even from the first, was thought of strictly as a gamble. Our one hope was, and must remain, that they will return. It would have been so much simpler all around, the State Department man said, if Adams had patented his method. The general raged at him. And had it published, all neat and orderly, in the patent orphan's records, so that anyone who wanted it could look at it up and have it? We can be most sincerely thankful, said the chairman, that he did not patent it. 6. The helicopter would never fly again, but the time unit was intact, which didn't mean that it would work. They held a powwow at their camp site. It had been, they decided, simpler to move the camp than to remove the body of old Buster, so they had shifted at dawn, leaving the old mastodon still sprawled across the helicopter. In a day or two, they knew, 
the great bones would be cleanly picked by the carrion birds, the lesser cats, the wolves and foxes, and the little skulkers. Getting the time unit out of the helicopter had been quite a chore, but they finally had managed, and now Adam sat with it cradles in his lap. The worst of it, he told them, is that I can't test it. There's no way to. You turn it on, and it works, or it doesn't work. You can't know till you try. That's something we can't help, Cooper replied. The problem seems to me is how we're going to use it without the whirlybird. We have to figure out some way to get up in the air, said Adams. We don't want to take the chance of going up into 20th century and arriving there about six feet underground. Common sense said that we should be higher here than up ahead, Hudson pointed out. These hills have stood here since Jurassic times. They probably were a good deal higher then, and have weathered down. That weathering still should be going on, so we should be higher here than in the twentieth century. Not much, perhaps, but higher. "'Did anyone ever notice what the altimeter read?' asked Cooper. "'I don't believe I did,' Adams admitted. "'It wouldn't tell you anyhow,' Hudson declared. It would just give a height then and now, and we were moving, remember. And what about air pockets and relative atmosphere density and all the rest? Cooper looked as discouraged as Hudson felt. How does this sound? asked Adams. We build a platform twelve feet high. That certainly should be enough to clear us and yet small enough to stay within the range of the unit's force field. And what if we're two feet higher here? Hudson pointed out. A fall of fourteen feet wouldn't kill a man unless he's plain unlucky. It might break some bones. So it might break some bones. You want to stay here or take a chance on a broken leg? All right, if you put it that way. A platform, you say. A platform out of what? Timber. There's lots of it. We just go out and cut some logs. A twelve-foot log is heavy. And how are we going to get that bigger log uphill? We drag it. We try to, you mean. Maybe we could fix up a cart, said Adams, after thinking a moment. Out of what? Cooper asked. Rollers, maybe. We could cut some and roll the logs up here. That would work on level ground, Hudson said. It wouldn't work to roll a log uphill. It would get away from us. Someone might get killed. The logs would have to be longer than twelve feet anyhow, Cooper put in. You'd have to set them in a hole, and that takes away some footage. Why not the tripod principle, Hudson offered. Fasten three logs at the top and raise them. That's a gin pole, a primitive derrick. It'd still have to be longer than twelve feet. Fifteen, sixteen, maybe. And how are we going to hoist three sixteen-foot logs? We'd need a block and tackle. There's another thing, said Cooper. Part of those logs might be just beyond the effective range of the force field. Part of them would have to, have to, mind you, move in time, and part couldn't. That would set up a stress. Another thing about it, added Hudson, is that we'd travel with the logs. I don't want to come out in another time with a bunch of logs flying all around me. Cheer up, Adams told them. Maybe the unit won't work anyhow. 7. The general sat alone in his office and held his head between his hands. The fools, he thought. The goddamn knuckle-headed fools. Why couldn't they see it as clearly as he did? For fifteen years now, as head of Project Mastodon, he had lived with it night and day, and he could see all the possibilities as clearly as if they had been actual fact. Not military possibilities alone, although as a military man he naturally would think of those first. The hidden bases, for example, located within the very strongholds of potential enemies, within, yet centuries removed in time. Many centuries removed, and only seconds distant. He could see it all, the materialization of the fleets, the swift, devastating blow, 
than the instantaneous retreat into the fastness of the past. Terrific destruction, but not a ship lost, nor a man. Except that if you had the bases, you need never strike the blow. If you had the bases, and that the enemy know you had them, there would never be the provocation. And on the home front, you'd have air raid shelters that would be effective. You'd evacuate your population not in space, but time. You'd have the sure and absolute defence against any kind of bombing, fission, fusion, bacteriological or whatever else the labs had in stock. And if the worst should come, which it never would with a setup like that, you'd have a place to which the entire nation could retreat, leaving to the enemy the empty, blasted cities and the lethally dusted countryside. Sanctuary. That had been what Hudson had offered the then Secretary of State fifteen years ago. And the idiot had frozen up with the insult of it, and had Hudson thrown out. And if war did not come, think of the living space and the vast new opportunities, not the least of which would be the opportunity to achieve peaceful living in a virgin world, where the old hatreds would slough off and new concepts have a chance to grow. He wondered where they were, those three who had gone back into time. Dead, perhaps, run down by a mastodon, or stalked by tigers, or maybe done in by warlike tribesmen. Nah, he kept forgetting there weren't any in that era. Or trapped in time, unable to get back, condemned to exile in an alien time. Or maybe, he thought, just plain disgusted, and he couldn't blame them if they were. Or maybe, let's be fantastic about this, sneaking in colonists from some place other than the watched Wisconsin farm, building up in actuality the nation they had claimed to be. They had to get back to the present soon, or Project Mastodon would be killed entirely. Already the research programme had been halted, and if something didn't happen quickly, the watch that was kept on the Wisconsin farm would be called off. "'And if they do that,' said the General, "'I know just what I'll do.' He got up and strode around the room. "'By God!' he said. "'I'll show him. Eight. It had taken ten full days of back-breaking work to build the pyramid. They hauled the rocks from the creek bed half a mile away and had piled them, stone by rolling stone, to the height of a full twelve feet. It took a lot of rocks and a lot of patience, for as the pyramid went up, the base naturally kept broadening out. But now all was finally ready. Hudson sat before the burnt-out campfire and held his blistered hands before him. It should work, he thought, better than the logs, and less dangerous. Grab a handful of sand. Some trickled back between your fingers, but most stayed in your grasp. That was the principle of the pyramid of stones. When, and if, the time machine should work, most of the rocks would go along. Those that didn't go would simply trickle out and do no harm. There'd be no stress or strain to upset the working of the force field. And if the time unit didn't work, or if it did, this was the end of the dream, thought Hudson, no matter how you looked at it. For even if they did get back to the twentieth century, there would be no money, and with the film lost and no other taken to replace it, they'd have no proof they had travelled back beyond the dawn of history, back almost to the dawn of man. Although how far you travelled would have no significance. An hour or a million years would be all the same. If you could span the hour, you could span the million years. And if you could go back the million years, it was within your power to go back to the first tick of eternity, the first stir of time across the face of emptiness and nothingness, back to that initial instant when nothing as yet had happened or been planned or thought, 
when all the vastness of the universe was a new slate waiting the first chalk stroke of destiny. Another helicopter would cost thirty thousand dollars, and they didn't even have the money to buy the tractor that they needed to build the stockade. There was no way to borrow. You couldn't walk into a bank and say you wanted thirty thousand to take a trip back to the old Stone Age. You still could go to some industry, or some university, or the government, and if you could persuade them you had something on the ball. Why, then, they might put up the cash after cutting themselves in on just about all of the profits, and naturally they'd run the show because it was their money, and all you had done was the sweating and the bleeding. "'There's one thing that still bothers me,' said Cooper, breaking the silence. "'We spent a lot of time picking our spot so we'd miss the barn and house and all the other buildings.' "'Don't tell me the windmill!' Hudson cried. "'No, I'm pretty sure we're clear of that. But the way I figure, we're right astraddle that barbed wire fence at the south end of the orchard. "'If you want, we could move the pyramid over twenty feet or so.' Cooper groaned. "'I'll take my chances with the fence.' Adams got to his feet, the time unit tucked underneath his arm. "'Come on, you guys, it's time to go.' They climbed the pyramid gingerly and stood unsteadily at its top. Adams shifted the unit around, clasped it to his chest. "'Stand around close,' he said, "'and bend your knees a little. It may be quite a drop.' "'Go ahead,' said Cooper. "'Press the button.' Adams pressed the button. Nothing happened. The unit didn't work. 9. The Chief of Central Intelligence was white-lipped when he finished talking. "'You're sure of your information?' asked the President. "'Mr. President,' said the CIA Chief, "'I've never been more sure of anything in my entire life.' The President looked at the other two who were in the room, a question in his eyes. The JCS chairman said, "'He checks, sir, with everything we know.' "'But it's incredible,' the President said. "'They're afraid,' said the CIA chief. "'They lie awake nights. They've become convinced that we're on the verge of travelling in time. They tried and failed, but they think we're near success. To their way of thinking, They've got to hit us now or never, because once we actually get time travel, they know their number's up. But we dropped Project Mastodon entirely almost three years ago. It's been all of ten years since we stopped the research. It was twenty-five years ago, that Hudson. That makes no difference, sir. They're convinced we dropped the project publicly, but went underground with it. That would be the kind of strategy they could understand. The President picked up a pencil and doodled on a pad. "'Who was that old general?' he asked. "'The one who raised so much fuss when we dropped the project. "'I remember I was in the Senate then. "'He came around to see me.' "'Bowers, sir,' said the JCS chairman. "'That's right. What became of him?' "'Retired.' "'Well, I guess it doesn't make any difference now.' "'He doodled some more and finally said, "'Gentlemen, it looks like this is it. "'How much time did you say we had?' "'Not more than ninety days, sir. Maybe as little as thirty. The President looked up at the JCS chairman. "'We're as ready,' said the chairman, "'as we'll ever be. We can handle them, I think. There will, of course, be some—' "'I know,' said the President. "'Could we bluff?' asked the Secretary of State, speaking quietly. "'I know it wouldn't stick, but at least we might buy some time.' "'You mean hint that we have time travel?' The secretary nodded. "'It wouldn't work,' said the CIA chief tiredly. "'If we really had it, there'd be no question, then. "'They'd become exceedingly well-mannered, even neighbourly, "'if they were sure we had it.' "'But we haven't got it,' said the President gloomily. Ten. The two hunters trudged homeward late in the afternoon, with a deer slung from a pole they carried on their shoulders. Their breath hung visibly in the air as they walked along, 
for the frost had come, and any day now they knew there would be snow. "'I'm worried about Wes,' said Cooper, breathing heavily. "'He's taking this too hard. We've got to keep an eye on him.' "'Let's take a rest,' panted Hudson. They halted and lowered the deer to the ground. "'He blames himself too much,' said Cooper. He wiped his sweaty forehead. "'There isn't any need to. All of us walked into this with our eyes wide open.' He's kidding himself and he knows it, but it gives him something to go on. As long as he can keep busy with all his puttering around, he'll be all right. He isn't going to repair the time unit, Chuck. I know he isn't, and he knows it too. He hasn't got the tools or the materials. Back in the workshop he might have a chance, but here he hasn't. It's rough on him. It's rough on all of us. "'Yes, but we didn't get a brainstorm that marooned two old friends in this tail end of nowhere. "'And we can't make him swallow it when we say that it's okay. We don't mind at all.' "'That's a lot to swallow, Johnny.' "'What's going to happen to us, Chuck?' "'We've got ourselves a place to live, and there's lots to eat. "'Save our ammo for the big game, a lot of eating for each bullet, and trap the smaller animals.' I'm wondering what will happen when the flour and all the other stuff is gone. We don't have too much of it because we always figured we could bring in more. We'll live on meat, said Hudson. We got bison by the million. The Plains Indians lived on them alone, and in the spring we'll find roots, and in the summer berries, and in the fall we'll harvest a half dozen kind of nuts. Some day our ammo will be gone, no matter how careful we are with it. Bows and arrows, slingshots, spears. There's a lot of beasts here I wouldn't want to stand up to with nothing but a spear. We won't stand up to them. We'll duck when we can and run when we can't duck. Without our guns, we're no lords of creation, not in this place. We won't stand up to them. We'll duck when we can and run when we can't duck. Without our guns, we're no lords of creation, not in this place. If we're going to live, we'll have to recognise that fact. And if one of us gets sick, or breaks a leg, or... We'll do the best we can. Nobody lives forever. But they were talking around the thing that really bothered them, Hudson told himself, each of them afraid to speak the thought aloud. They'd live all right, so far as food, shelter and clothing were concerned, and they'd live most of that time in plenty, for this was a fat and open-handed land, and a man could make an easy living. But the big problem, the one they were afraid to talk about, was their emptiness of purpose. To live, they had to find some meaning in a world without society. A man cast away on a desert isle could always live for hope, but here there was no hope. A Robinson Crusoe was separated from his fellow humans by, at the most, a few thousand miles. Here they were separated by a hundred and fifty thousand years. Wes Adams was the lucky one so far. Even playing his thousand-to-one shot, he still held tightly to a purpose, feeble as it might be, the hope that he could repair the time machine. We don't need to watch him now, thought Hudson. The time we'll have to watch is when he's forced to admit he can't fix the machine. And both Hudson and Cooper had been kept sane enough, for there had been the cabin to be built, and the winter's supply of wood to cut, and the hunting to be done. But then there would come a time when all the chores were finished and there was nothing left to do. "'You ready to go?' asked Cooper. "'Sure. All rested now,' said Hudson. They hoisted the pole to their shoulders and started off again. Hudson had lain awake nights thinking of it, and all the thoughts had been dead ends. One could write of natural history of the Pleistocene, complete with photographs and sketches, and it would be a pointless thing to do, 
because no future scientist would ever have a chance to read it. Or they might labour to build a memorial, a vast pyramid perhaps, which could carry a message forward across fifteen hundred centuries, snatching with bare hands at a semblance of immortality. But if they did, they would be working against the sure and certain knowledge that it all would come to naught, for they knew in advance that no such pyramid existed in historic time. Or they might set out to seek contemporary man, hiking across four thousand miles of wilderness to Bering Strait and over into Asia, and having found contemporary man cowering in his caves, they might be able to help him immeasurably along the road to his great inheritance, except that they'd never make it, and even if they did, contemporary man undoubtedly would find some way to do them in, and might eat them in the bargain. They came out of the woods, and there was the cabin just a hundred yards away. It crouched against the hillside above the spring, with a sweep of grassland billowing beyond it to the slate-grey skyline. A trickle of smoke came up from the chimney, and they saw the door was open. "'Wes oughtn't to leave it open that way,' said Cooper. "'No telling when a bear might decide to come visiting.' "'Hey, Wes!' yelled Hudson. But there was no sign of him. Inside the cabin a white sheet of paper lay on the table-top. Hudson snatched it up and read it, with Cooper as his shoulder. "'Dear guys, I don't want to get your hopes up again and have you disappointed, but I think I may have found the trouble. I'm going to try it out. If it doesn't work, I'll come back and burn this note and never say a word. But if you find the note, you'll know it worked, and I'll be back to get you. Wes. Hudson crumpled the note in his hand. The crazy fool! He's gone off his rocker, Cooper said. He just thought... The same thought struck them both, and they bolted for the door. At the corner of the cabin they skidded to a halt and stood there, staring at the ridge above them. The pyramid of rocks they'd built two months ago was gone. 11. The crash brought General Leslie Bowers, retired, up out of bed, about two feet out of bed, old muscles tense, white moustache bristling. Even at his age, the general was a man of action. He flipped the covers back, swung his feet out to the floor, and grabbed the shotgun leaning against the wall. Muttering, he blundered out of the bedroom, marched across the dining room, and charged into the kitchen. There, beside the door, he snapped on the switch that turned on the floodlights. He practically took the door off its hinges getting to the stoop, and he stood there, bare feet gripping the planks, nightshirt billowing in the wind, the shotgun poised and ready. "'What's going on out there?' he bellowed. There was a tremendous pile of rocks resting where he'd parked his car. One crumpled fender and a drunken headlight peeped out of the rubble. A man was clambering carefully down the jumbled stones, making a detour to dodge the battered fender. The general pulled back the hammer of the gun and fought to control himself. The man reached the bottom of the pile and turned around to face him. The general saw that he was hugging something tightly to his chest. Mister, the general told him, your explanation better be a good one. That was a brand new car, and this was the first time I was set for a night of sleep since my tooth quit aching. The man just stood and looked at him. Who in thunder are you? roared the general. The man walked slowly forward. He stopped at the bottom of the stoop. "'My name is Wesley Adams,' he said. "'I'm—' "'Wesley Adams?' howled the general. "'My God, man, where have you been all these years?' "'Well, I don't imagine you'll believe me, but the fact is, "'We've been waiting for you for twenty-five long years. "'Or rather, I've been waiting for you. "'Those other idiots gave up.' I've waited right here for you, Adams, for the last three years, ever since they called off the guard. Adams gulped. I'm sorry about the car. You see, it was this way. 
The general, he saw, was beaming at him fondly. "'I had faith in you,' the general said. He waved the shotgun by way of invitation. "'Come on in. I have a call to make.' Adams stumbled up the stairs. "'Move!' the general ordered, shivering. "'On the double! You want me to catch my death of cold out here?' Inside, he fumbled for the lights and turned them on. He laid the shotgun across the kitchen table and picked up the telephone. "'Give me the White House at Washington,' he said. "'Yes, I said the White House. The President? Naturally, he's the one I want to talk to. Yes, it's all right. He won't mind them I calling him.' "'Sir?' said Adams tentatively. The General looked up. "'What is it, Adams? Go ahead and say it.' "'Did you say twenty-five years?' "'That's what I said. What we're doing all that time?' Adams grasped the table and hung on. "'But it wasn't.' "'Yes,' said the General to the operator. "'Yes, I'll wait.' He held his hand over the receiver and looked inquiringly at Adams. "'I imagine you'll want the same terms as before.' "'Terms?' "'Sure. Recognition. Point for aid. Defence pact.' Uh, "'I suppose so,' Adams said. "'You got these saps across the barrel,' the General told him happily. "'You can get anything you want. You rate it, too, after what you've done and the bonehead treatment you got, but especially for not selling out.' Twelve. The night editor read the bulletin just off the teletype. "'Well, what do you know?' he said. "'We just recognised Macedonia.' He looked at the copy chief. "'Where the hell is Macedonia?' he asked. The copy chief shrugged. "'Don't ask me. You're the brain in this joint.' "'Well, let's get a map for the next edition,' said the night editor. Thirteen. Tabby, the sabre-tooth, dabbed playfully at Cooper with his mighty paw. Cooper kicked him in the ribs, an equally playful gesture. Tabby snarled at him. "'Show your teeth at me, will you?' said Cooper. "'Raise you from a kitten, and that's a gratitude you show. Do it just once more, and I'll belt you in the chops.' Tabby lay down blissfully and began to wash his face. "'Some day,' warned Hudson, "'that cat will miss a meal, and that's the day you're it.' "'Gentle as a dove,' Cooper assured him. "'Wouldn't hurt a fly.' "'Well, one thing about it. "'Nothing dares to bother us with that monstrosity around. "'Best watchdog there ever was. "'Got to have something to guard all this stuff we got. "'When Wes gets back, we'll be millionaires. "'All those furs and ginseng and the ivory. "'If he gets back. "'He'll be back. Quit your worrying.' "'But it's been five years,' Hudson protested. "'He'll be back. Something happened, that's all. "'He'll probably be working on it right now. "'Could be that he messed up the time-setting when he repaired the unit, "'where it might have been knocked out of kilter when Buster hit the helicopter. "'That would take a while to fix. "'I don't worry that he won't come back. "'What I can't figure out is why did he go and leave us?' "'I've told you,' Hudson said. "'He was afraid it wouldn't work.' "'There wasn't any need to be scared of that. "'We never would have laughed at him.' "'No, of course we wouldn't.' "'Then what was he scared of?' Cooper asked. "'If the unit failed, and we knew it failed, "'Wes was afraid we'd try to make him see "'how hopeless and insane it was, "'and he knew we'd probably convince him, "'and then all his hope would be gone. "'And he wanted to hang on to that Johnny. "'He wanted to hang on to his hope, "'even when there wasn't any left.' "'That doesn't matter now,' said Cooper. "'What counts is that he'll come back. "'I can feel it in my bones.' "'And here's another case,' thought Hudson, "'of hope begging to be allowed to go on living. "'God,' he thought, "'I wish I could be that blind.' "'Wes is working on it right now,' said Cooper confidently. Fourteen. He was not he alone, but a thousand others working desperately, knowing that the time was short, working not alone for two men trapped in time, but for the peace they had all dreamed about, that the whole world had yearned for through the ages. For to be of any use, 
It was imperative that they could zero in the time machines they meant to build as an artilleryman would zero in a battery of guns, that each time machine would take its occupants to the same instant of the past, that their operation would extend over the same period of time to the exact second. It was a problem of control and calibration, starting with a prototype that was calibrated as its finest instrument for jumps of 50,000 years. Project Mastodon was finally underway. The End Subscribe for your daily stories of futures past. A new story every single day.